Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Parish in Brookline, a uni Unitarian Universalist congregation. Wherever your life and faith journey has taken you, you are welcome here. Whatever your gifts or abilities may be, however you identify your gender, you are welcome here. If this is your first time with us, please fill out a visitor card found on the backs of the pews and place it in the offering plate later in the service. Our service today is led by our guest minister, Reverend Mary Margaret Earle. Reverend Earle is the senior minister and executive director at the UU Urban Ministry, located in John Elliott Square in the heart of Roxbury. First Parish is one of nearly 50 UU congregations that are members of the Urban Ministry. In her four years at the Urban Ministry, Reverend Earle has led the revitalization of its youth domestic violence and community engagement programs. And most importantly, she has worked in partnership with the Urban Ministry's Roxbury neighbors to work toward justice and cross boundaries of faith, class, and race. The flowers on the altar today are given by Julie Harvath in honor of her mothers, Julia and Marilyn. After the service, we invite everyone to join in coffee hour, which takes place in Lyon Chapel out this door to your right. Anne Dinsmore and Eliza Blanchard of the Welcome Committee invite you to join them on the couches in the Peterson Room for conversation about becoming more connected at First Parish. And please pick up a striped mug if you are new or visiting and would like to meet and talk with others. Welcome to all. This morning, the clouds yield to sun. Mother Winter begins to pull away her drape of cold and quiet, and we begin to imagine spring and its surge of light and green bulbs rising. Lovely be that promise. At this, the early cusp of change, life says, wait. Let us breathe in this day now with its tree branches still bare and elegant against blue skies, with layers of last year's leaves dulled and huddled over frozen earth protecting new life. This is mighty and beautiful too. 
this day is worthy of our full attention to. Come. Come into this place of worship open to the gifts of this season and this morning and this moment. Come in praise and hope. Come in worry and pain. Come with tribulation and celebration. Come heart opening and opening wider. Come any size and shape and age, any orientation and color and language and place of birth. Come into this moment and breathe and be. Come in need and in strength. Come ready to live into this day. Come, let us worship together. I invite you to join in singing our opening hymn, number 126, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. At this time, I would like to invite Barbara Simonetti and Elena Garofoli to come forward to light the chalice, symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith the world over. As they light the chalice, please join me in our unison affirmation printed in your order of service, in English and then in Spanish. We give ourselves one unto another, covenanting to walk together in congregation, promising faithfully to watch over one another and to delight for love to abide in our midst. Nos entregamos y nos complementemos a caminar juntos como congregación, promotiendo con mucha fe cuidarnos mutuamente y delertarnos en el amor que permanecerá entre nosotros. Each week we also light two candles of peace and hope. They represent places that need our love and prayers now and throughout the week. After each candle is lit, we will speak the words for peace in, Ar in English, Arabic, and Hebrew. Peace, salam, shalom. Our first candle is lit for Honduras where climate change is causing droughts, storms, floods, and landslides that are having devastating impacts on agriculture and accelerating the exodus of residents north to Mexico and the United States. Peace, salam, shalom. Our second candle is lit for Roxbury, 
where more than 50 residents gathered recently to develop proactive solutions to the challenges being brought by gentrification. Peace, salam, shalom. I would like to invite all of our kids to come forward for the Time for All Ages. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming up. Uh, so I have a story to tell about a mouse named Penelope, who was a very adventurous mouse. And Penelope lived in a little village in a little cottage with her mother and father mouse and grandma mouse. And one day, Penelope was at school and she heard very exciting news that her classmates had seen the biggest, tallest, most gorgeous sunflower growing up at the very top of the Great Hill. And this was very exciting but because for mice, sunflower seeds are about the best, most yummiest treat they ever had. Have you ever eaten sunflower seeds? For, for mice, it is like the best cookie or best piece of pie or best cake because they loved the way that it's chewy and tasty and nutty. There was one problem. The big, tall, beautiful sunflower that they were longing to snack on was behind the castle wall. Now, once upon a time, there had been a king and queen, and they built a castle, and they surrounded it by a big, tall wall. And the queen and king had long ago moved away, but the wall remained. And the mice, longing for the sunflower seed snacks, couldn't figure out how to get over the wall. Now, Penelope was an adventurous mouse, and she had an idea. So right after school, she ran home, opened the door, threw down her books, and her grandmother called out, Penelope, Penelope, wait, I have something to tell you. Not now, Grandma. I have places to go and things to do. Penelope ran out, ran up the great hill, and she was going to climb over that wall. And she looked, and she looked, and she looked for a little crack or crevice or some way to get her paws in to pull herself up. And she looked, and she looked, and she couldn't find it because the king and the queen had thought of that, and they had made the wall like glass. The sun began setting, and she trudged home, disappointed. The next morning, she had an idea. So after school, she came in, opened the door, threw down her books, and her grandmother called out, Penelope, Penelope, I have something to tell you. Not now, Grandma. I have places to go and things to do. She ran up the great hill, and this time, she was going to dig under the wall. So she started digging up piles of dirt with her paws and digging and digging and digging and digging. The queen and king had thought of that too, so they poured the foundation for the wall deep, deep, deep in the earth, and she couldn't dig far enough to get underneath it. The sun began setting, and she trudged home. The next morning, she had one last idea. So after school, she ran home, threw down her books. Grandmother yelled out, Penelope, Penelope, I have something to tell you. Not now, Grandma. I have places to go and things to do. And she ran up the great hill, and she had seen a big, tall pine tree growing near the wall. So she, being a good, cl good climber, scaled up to the tippy top of the tree, ran out to a tippy end of the branch, and started moving up and down, up and down on that tree branch. And then she hurled herself, trying to fling herself over the wall. She couldn't quite make it, and she tumbled down into, luckily, a soft bush. She had no more ideas. She trudged home as the sun set, and the next day, she came home from school. She put down her books, and Grandma said, Penelope, come sit down beside me by the fire. So Penelope came over. She sat down, and Grandma said, Penelope, when I was a little girl, the king and the queen were still living in the castle. And when they left, one of my friends told me where they placed a secret key to the gate to open and get beyond the wall. And Penelope said, Grandma, why didn't you tell me this? <laughs> and so Penelope went up the hill, uncovered the rock, and there she found 
this key. And sure enough, she put the key into the gate, turned it, and opened it. And there was this beautiful, delicious sunflower. And she ran down and got all her friends. And they ran up the hill and they nibbled on sunflower seeds for that day and many days after. And what Penelope learned was that sometimes it's wonderful to have adventures, but it's also good to listen to mom and dad and grandma and grandpa, because sometimes they can help us make our adventures even better. So that is our story. And I would invite us to sing the children out. I invite us to take a deep breath, to come fully into this place, find a way to sit that is comfortable for you, settle in, close your eyes, and enter together into a time of prayer and meditation. Loving spirit, we gather in this sacred space, seeking renewal and strength and kinship and courage. We gather in times when so much is being uncovered, the pain and oppressions and injustice that follow us through the generations and over centuries in times when national tension and turmoil is hard to bear and sometimes hard to find hope. Be with us as we pause to breathe in and breathe out and find our center and our connection with something bigger than ourselves. Help us Connect with that which can guide our steps forward. Be with us, too, in our personal struggles. We bring with us illness, family pain and worry, strains at work. Help us to remember that each of us is beloved, no matter what. And let that knowing give us strength for the journey ahead. Let us enter into a time of silent prayer, meditation, reflection.
Amen. I would invite you to join, join me in responsive reading number 594, Principles and Purposes. I'll ask you to read what's in italics. We affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. We affirm and promote justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. We affirm and promote acceptance of one another and encouragement of spiritual growth. We affirm and promote a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We believe that each person must be free to search for what is true and right in life. We affirm and promote the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process. We believe that all people should have a voice in the vote about the things that concern them. We affirm and promote the goal of world community with peace liberty, and justice for all. We believe that we should work for a peaceful, fair, and free world. We affirm and promote respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Our offering this morning will be given to the UU Urban Ministry 
which provides programs for youth, services for survivors of domestic violence, and community engagement events for individuals and communities in Boston. The offering will now be gratefully received. If you are visiting First Parish for the first time, please feel free to let the basket pass you by. We are so glad to have you with us. For all that has been shared and all that has been received, we say thank you. Our reading today is from the book, So You Want to Talk About Race, by Ijeoma Alau. We have to remember that racism was designed to support an economic and social system for those at the very top. This was never motivated by hatred of people of color, and the goal was never, in and of itself, simply the subjugation of people of color. The ultimate goal of racism was the profit and comfort of the white race, specifically of rich white men. The oppression of people of color was an easy way to get this wealth and power, 
and racism was a good way to justify it. This is not about sentiment beyond the ways in which our sentiment is manipulated to maintain an unjust system of power. And our emotions, ignorance, fear, and hate have been easily manipulated to feed the system of white supremacy. And we have to address all of this, our emotions, our ignorance, our fear, and our hate. But we cannot ignore the system that takes all of that, magnifies it, and uses it to crush the lives and liberty of people of color to enrich the most privileged of white society. So ends the reading. I invite you to join in singing our next hymn, which is number 95 in the hymnal. There is more love somewhere, hymn number 95 in the hymnal. I am very uh, happy and honored to be in Brookline again with you. I've preached here a few times since arriving at the Urban Ministry and have appreciated the ways that Brookline uh, continues to weave itself into the work of the Urban Ministry. Um, in addition to being a member congregation, there are some among you have been great friends of the Urban Ministry. I've been enjoying 
uh, getting to know your new minister, Lisa Perry Wood, whose installation I'll attend next week, and other friends like Janet Britcher, who's facilitated uh, work that we've done to evolve our programs, and um, dear Barb Simonetti, who has uh, recently helped us through a very um, a uh, rich, important process of really thinking about our relationship with our neighbors in Roxbury. And uh, most especially our board chair par excellence, Carla Baer, who uh, helps lead the organization uh, courageously and ably and uh, for whom I am deeply grateful. I also want to let you know that today, after the service, if you're interested in learning more about the urban ministry, my colleague Annie Stubbs is with us, and she'll be in social hour ready to answer your questions and hopefully have you sign up for our uh, newsletter. So uh, I'm wondering if this has happened to you. Has there been a day when you just couldn't listen to the news anymore? And so you turned off the radio or shut off the TV and folded up the newspaper, even removed the Facebook app from your smartphone. Uh, that's happened to me. Uh, last summer, it was on the heels of news about immigrant families who were torn apart at the border, the rolling back of environmental protections and threats to our mother earth. I couldn't bear the news loop anymore. So I turned off my car radio, and I looked for another way to pass the time on my daily commute into Roxbury. I began listening to audiobooks. I chose first 1776, a Pulitzer Prize-winning history of the military battles of that year. That may sound dry, but I listened rapt to hear how the Roxbury campus where the UU Urban Ministry stands played a key role during the siege of Boston, how Patriot troops gathered on the green space where I walk daily, how General George Washington visited, the nitty gritty details of that long ago time was a lovely respite from the shoulder tensing, heart dropping news. Getting away from today by immersion in the long ago was just the medicine that I needed. Thomas Jefferson, The Art of Power, was the book I listened to next. Jefferson lived in intense times and also shaped them. Inspired by Enlightenment ideals, he advocated for independence from Britain, drafted the Declaration of Independence, and became our nation's first Secretary of State and then later a President. And this, I kept listening. Jefferson, born into a slave-holding, privileged Virginia family, identified slavery as sinful, but remained immersed in it until he died for his own life's comfort. He used his power over an enslaved woman in his household, her name was Sally Hemings, who then bore him children who lived not as his beloved offspring, but as his profit-making slaves too. I kept listening. Jefferson, early on, advocated for abolishing slavery, this part of our American history many of us have learned. But Jefferson did not believe that white people and black people could, in fact, live freely together. The only path he saw to abolishing slavery was expatriation, to send the slaves away. At the root of it was his fear, a deep, fear shared by his slave-holding neighbors that enslaved African Americans, if freed, would rise up and seek revenge on their oppressors. We have the wolf by the ear, Jefferson wrote, and we can neither hold him nor safely let him go. Justice is on one scale and self-preservation on the other. And I listened to the centuries-old story of how those who have shaped our country were shaped themselves by a reliance upon and a fear of African Americans. I listened about how the role of the free press was a source of fraught national disagreement, 
how Congress became polarized over the politics of the day, so much so that debates became brawls and duels. I no longer was stepping away from today's news stories. I was looking more deeply into them and seeing also that I must. Ours is an optimistic faith, one that looks toward the future. We define our Unitarian Universalist faith in many ways as covenantal instead of creedal. We challenge the status quo instead of preserving it and this. We believe in progress, we believe in tomorrow, and we work for it. The Unitarian minister, the Reverend Theodore Parker, in a quote made famous by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, said this. Look at the facts of the world. You see a continual and progressive triumph of the good. I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but a little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience. And from what I see, I am sure that it bends toward justice. Especially now, our Unitarian Universalist faith calls us to lead the way forward and away from the bubbling cauldron of angry nationalism and fear that is driving us backwards. We are in a bruising tug of war, our fingers raw and curl tightly around the rope as we pull, resisting slipping into the muck of the past, instead pulling toward the greener grass of a future that is more inclusive, more just, more loving, more open, a future in which the whole human family, black, brown, indigenous, GLBTQ, all the ways we were born, that all of us have a place at the table. In the midst of the turmoil, something new is being born and something is dying. But to be midwife to something new, to help give birth to a step in our human evolution means we must not just grab the rope tighter and simply pull forward. We must also look back. We must understand our history in order to understand where we are and then move ahead. This call to examine history is at the heart of the healing and justice work of the UU Urban Ministry in Roxbury. Founded 190 years ago, the Urban Ministry is one of the nation's oldest nonprofits, and for 40 years of that history, we have been located on a deeply historic campus in Roxbury, the heart of Boston's historic African American community. Our campus is located in John Elliott Square in a neighborhood where the Puritans gathered in 1631, where the Irish immigrants came later, and then Jewish immigrants, and then the African American community. Our campus includes our flagship building, Boston's oldest surviving wood frame church called First Church in Roxbury. No longer home to a congregation, it was built in 1804, the fifth meeting house on the site. It was the starting point for William Dawes' midnight ride of 1775, a ride parallel to Paul Revere's to warn that the British were coming. In this historic place, we do three basic things today. We serve survivors of domestic violence. We support the education of young people of color from Roxbury, Mattapan, and Dorchester, and we serve our Roxbury neighborhood through the arts. Here, we interrogate the past, and we also look with hope toward the future. We honor personal history. For nearly 40 years, we've operated our Renewal House Domestic Violence Shelter, and last year launched a job readiness program for survivors. We begin by honoring a survivor's own history and story. This is the way the director of that program describes the work. Instead of erasing the trauma of abuse and assault, we encourage survivors to acknowledge their history and their strength in living through it. 
Survivors examined their own childhoods and asked, what was helpful? What hurt? What do I want to pass on to my children? That recollection is painful, but it can break the cycle of violence. Naming history can change the future. To move ahead, we look back. We honor community history. Our youth program supports young people who have a drive to live into their own potential and future. In the midst of an unjust educational system that bestows abundance on suburban white children as it skimps on children in Boston, we seek to level the playing field. We provide tutoring and college prep and college visits. And we also celebrate the community from which our bright and determined young people come, training them to lead historic walking tours in Roxbury. Among our tour guides is Jennifer, a high school junior from Roxbury. She is a bright light. She spent the summer learning about Marcus Garvey, after whom the elder housing across the street from the urban ministry was named. She learned about Malcolm X, who once lived in Roxbury, about his time in prison, his conversion to Islam, his second chance, his transformational leadership. Her growing knowledge of the places she passes by each day and what they represent have deepened her neighborhood pride. Sometimes, she said, People have negative ideas about Roxbury. She now knows the deeper stories of strength and resilience there. And she says that each of us has a responsibility to do likewise about our own communities, to learn our history. If you're going to live somewhere, she told me, you should know about it. By looking back, she propels herself forward and who knows how far she'll go. And examining the history of race in America is foundational for our community engagement work. Dismantling racism is not about personal guilt. It's about education and understanding. In her book, So You Want to Talk About Race, the African-American author, Ijeoma Olawu, describes the chasm in historic understanding between white people and black people in responding to the Black Lives Matter movement. Alawu writes, if we want to understand how experiences and sentiments between police and communities of different races could be so different, we must first understand the historical relationship between police forces and communities of color. She describes how police forces, especially those in the South, grew out of night patrols whose primary charge was controlling black and Native American people, and slave patrols whose primary charge was catching escaped slaves. Out of these grew our modern police forces. Alao writes, our early American police forces existed not only to combat crime, but also to return black Americans to slavery and to control and intimidate free black populations. Police were rightfully feared and loathed by black Americans in the North and the South. Our police force, she writes, was not created to serve black Americans. It was created to police black Americans and serve white Americans. This history is not about individual police officers. Rather, it's about the system that they and we inherit, consciously or unconsciously. History illuminates this moment in time. Police prison and health systems, wealth and educational disparities all call for an examination with a historical lens. Brian Stevenson, founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, which combats racial bias in the criminal justice system, founded a museum that tells the story of lynchings in the South, and he described why. He said, in the American South, we don't talk about slavery. 
We don't have monuments and memorials that confront the legacy of lynching. We haven't really confronted the difficulties of segregation. And because of that, we are still burdened by that history. We are still burdened by that history. To move forward together, we must look back. And we don't need to look way down south to learn about deeply rooted racism and violence. Kevin Peterson of the New Democracy Coalition in Boston is calling for a hearing to rename Faneuil Hall. Who's heard about the effort to have a hearing to rename Faneuil Hall? So a fair number of folks here. Peterson, who's African American, is a man of deep faith. He sees his work for racial justice as spiritual, religious, transformational work, the work of justice and reconciliation. This fall, I met with him recently over coffee, and he shared that he began researching the history of Faneuil Hall when our country was reeling from the white supremacist march in Charlottesville the year earlier. He found a letter that Peter Faneuil, the hall's namesake, had written proposing building the hall. Faneuil was a mogul in Boston, and he wanted a place where men like him, businessmen, could gather for commerce. He even offered to pay for it with the body of a child. To fund the construction, he wrote, I'm going to sell an African boy that I have. Peterson, reading that line, felt anger, humiliation, and pain. He imagined himself as that child. The foundation of the creation of Faneuil Hall on the back of an anonymous child, he says, insults the civic dignity of blacks and whites alike. Nearby Faneuil Hall was the building where slaves would continue to be sold long after. Peterson sees in this foundation of Boston's commerce a thread that wends through history into today when the racial wealth gap means that the median net worth, I don't mean income, I mean what you still have after you count your assets, after you've subtracted your debts, when the median net worth for white households in Boston is $247,000, and for black households, it is $8. We don't know where this boy sold to build Faneuil Hall came from, whether he was torn from his mother somewhere near Boston, whether he had come directly from the African slave trade. We don't even know his name. But we now are being asked to consider him, to reckon with that past and his story. We arrive this morning in tumultuous times when there is so much unrest, so much anger, so much disorientation. We watch for something new being born in the midst of it, something new in which voices long hidden and silenced are finally raised up and heard when we are all called to the table, when we have reckoned with the past and can be freed from what haunts us. This is painful and unsettling work. We may be tempted to get lost in the anger of our times or turn away. We may be afraid. We may be tempted to vilify and simplify and simply react to the noise and the news. As people of faith, more is asked of us. We are asked to keep breathing in and out and finding our center in the midst of the tumult. We are asked to face the times in which we live and to face them with steadiness and with courage and to face them with love, great, transforming, impossible love, and to face them with knowledge 
to learn the real history of our nation's founding and trajectory, to deepen our knowledge of the past so that we can be guides in leading our world forward. I invite you to do that work with us at the Urban Ministry, to come volunteer with survivors in our job readiness program as they move their lives ahead. Even for one day, we need you. I invite you to come take a tour with our youth in our history program. Come, come to a community reading of African-American authors. Come for a performance honoring Martin Luther King. Talk with us in social hour about how to visit, attend our events, and be part of our work. Come, join us in this place where we keep learning from the past and lock arms and walk together into a brighter and more just future. Amen and blessed be. I invite you to stand and join with me in singing our final hymn, number 131, Love Will Guide Us. Please join me in our unison affirmation as Reverend Mary Margaret extinguishes the chalice. We extinguish the flame and not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry with us and offer as gifts unto the world. Go out remembering that you are beloved, and may that knowledge give you courage to take steps forward, to live more fully in love and for justice. Go out in peace, joy, and hope. The service has ended. <laughs>